The following is recorded with uh, Senator E. Melvin, M-E-L-V-I-N, Porter, P-O-R-T-E-R, uh, Oklahoma State Senator, a black senator. Um, the, uh, it was recorded by KTOK June 10, 1973. Headliners, a discussion with people who make the news, a public service presentation. Now here's your Headliners host. This is Mike Williams. My guest on Headliners today is State Senator E. Melvin Porter of Oklahoma City. Senator, welcome to Headliners. Thank you. This past week, you represented, represented Jerry Lee Cudjo as his defense attorney. Jerry Cudjo was convicted of one of the most controversial murders in recent Oklahoma history, the murder of Highway Patrolman Robert Ake last fall. And you, to this day, if I'm not mistaken, contend that Jerry Cudjo is innocent of that murder. Well, I, I am firmly convinced that he's innocent, and I'm even more firmly convinced that the state of Oklahoma did not have proof beyond a reasonable doubt to cause the jury to return a guilty verdict as quickly as they did, or, or even if they had taken some time. You mentioned after the trial that uh, there was an involvement, uh, or at least in your opinion, an involvement with his conviction and the fact that the jury is all white. Uh, is that a, a factor in every case where a black is tried? Well, where the crime is one that involves a black person having committed a crime against a white person of some alleged act of violence or, or rape, some alleged act of rape, I'm thoroughly convinced uh, that we that you've got to really search you like hell to get a jury of 12 men and women who will be completely unbiased. Out of the 13 years I've practiced law, I've never had but one white person to tell me that they were not prejudiced. And uh, that's, uh, you know, I know that's a damn lie. They're just not telling you. And uh, uh, never in Oklahoma but one time, and I, I've tried hundreds and hundreds of jury cases. Well, what, isn't there the same factor uh, if if a black man is accused of a crime against a white man and the jury is all black, wouldn't there be the same prejudice the other way? Wouldn't they have a tendency to free him because he's black? I suspect that uh, there would uh, be the same semblance of prejudice. Prejudice is not a one-way street. It's occupied in the bodies of both sides, uh, especially during uh, the last decade. My. my my main contention for normally wanting to have some black or black people on the jury is to, you can't penetrate what takes place in a jury room. The law just will not permit you to go in there. I don't care what takes place. You can't penetrate it. And that black person or black persons will normally act as a buffer to suppress uh, the emotions and prejudice of somebody who might explode or might reveal their prejudices or their emotions in the courtroom. In, in the jury room, and that's always a good buffer. I've had white jurors to tell me in deliberation of a given lawsuit that the word nigger and they're all alike and all type of uh, discussion has taken place that was not even in the trial of the case. Well, uh, do you believe then that the district attorney's office, at least in Oklahoma County, has, has made definite attempts for that reason to keep blacks off juries in such cases? In almost every s criminal case I have defended, the district attorney's office, through its preemptory challenges, particularly this district attorney's office, has kicked off uh, black persons. I think I tried one case with Jim McKinney where a black person was left on the jury, and, uh, but in, in uh, just about every other instance, they have removed them. And especially so if it's a case that involves a crime against uh, a white person of a violent nature. And also vice versa if it involves a crime against a white person for having committed a violent act, of, uh, a, a violent act against a black person, then they don't uh, leave a black person on the jury. Why not? Wouldn't that be uh, just one more assurance that however the chips may fall, justice would prevail? Well, I would think so. I, I think it's the inbred philosophy of the DA's office that uh, blacks are going to stick together and they're not going to do right, yet in Curtis's whole argument 
uh, closing argument, he argued that black people were were law-abiding citizens for the most part, and and uh, it was just this uh, renegade few. Uh, yet uh, uh, they uh, they in their selection of juries, uh, it's just the reverse. Might clarify briefly for those of our listeners who might not be aware when we talk about Curtis Harris, he's the district attorney in Oklahoma County, and his first assistant you mentioned is Jim McKinney. Do you believe that uh, that the justice system overall in the state of Oklahoma is uh, is pitted against blacks or, or against minorities overall? I think it still has a deep-seated, built-in prejudice that uh, has that is somewhat mild and and tolerated, uh, not openly admitted, but. Uh, I'm thoroughly convinced that white America in the last decade has perhaps uh, given a sense of rebirth to the deep-seated prejudice that, was occup that, that, that has been occupied by, by the majority, majority race. Why? Well, during the Johnson and Kennedy era, I think we had the type of leadership that exposed and openly revealed the sore spots of our bigotry and hate. And uh, with the birth of Richard Nixon and the whole concept of law and order, I think that we have reverted back to uh, the old cliche of we've perhaps gone too far under the Johnson and Kennedy era. And that national leadership has a tremendous impact on, on various states, particularly Oklahoma. Why particularly Oklahoma? Well, Oklahoma is still basically a southern state, a conservative uh, element. Uh, black people constitute a rare minority in this state. They even treat Indians worse. And uh, they sort of ride with the tide. Uh, and right now we're riding a hell of a tide of backwardness, in my opinion. You mentioned... Uh the Nixon administration coming in with the whole concept of the law and order program. You're not opposed to law and order, are you? Oh, I thoroughly subscribe to law and order. You can't have an organized society unless you have laws to govern yourself by and order in that society. But with that goes the watchword of justice, and nobody ever mentions that when they talk about law and order. Adolf Hitler had law and order. He had law and he had complete order. But during the course of law and order, he caused to be annihilated millions of Jews and uh, caused German people to accept the uh, philosophy that they were a super race. And it, of course, ultimately brought uh, about the downfall of Germany. But you've got to also talk about justice and equality under law and order. Well, where do you believe then that the United States is headed under the, the current philosophy of law and order? I think that the things that have occurred in the last several months, Watergate, the wiretapping and eavesdropping, uh, the, the exhibit of what money can buy and do, and particularly since it comes from the exponents of law and order, that we'll see a tremendous change in this country. And I'm thoroughly convinced with 18-year-olds having the right to vote and now serve on juries, we'll see... Uh, better judicial system. Well, you, you never did say exactly what direction you think the United States is headed in, though, do you? What do you think is in store for us in the future if we continue our current path? I think we're in store for a lot of uh, problems, uh, racial problems. Uh, we're in store with a lot of problems that deal with poverty itself. Uh, cost of living is getting... Uh, I'm, I'm thoroughly convinced we've got the type of national leadership that... Uh, the rich get richer, and the poor get poor. And uh, we'll either have to reject that type of leadership, or we're going to see one hell of a revolution in this country that perhaps we've never seen before in the sense of changing the political processes of government. If we could get back briefly to the case that you tried this past week, specifically the Cudjo case, why are you so convinced that Jerry Lee Cudjo did not murder the highway patrol officer? 
Well, what never really came out is the fact that the police department and law enforcement agencies had given Jerry Lee Cudjo lie detector exams and they had picked him up and released him and he passed them. Number two, the position of the body uh, as it related to the parked car and the highway and the distance between the powder burn. And number three, from what Cudjo himself told me, and uh, number four, I'm convinced that there was an effort to recover the reward money offered by the Gaylord uh, Press, and uh, I'm thoroughly convinced that that money can be tied or will be tied to the Ramsey family. Ramsey being the man who is reported to be an eyewitness, and, and you believe he actually shot the, the fatal bullet. Yes, I'm, I think that Ramsey uh, uh, grabbed the trooper's gun and shot him. Uh, Cudjo is not uh, uh, the most intelligent young man in the world, and I'm thoroughly convinced that both of the boys were drinking that night. And uh, if Cudjo told people that he had the gun and he shot the trooper, I think it was more as a he was bragging more than uh, any genuine sincerity, and he was also probably, uh, I think it made him feel as if he was a big man. You know, one of the big problems in defending people, unless uh, you're damn near a millionaire, a millionaire can, can always win a lawsuit, in my opinion. But you've got to employ psychologists and get them on the stand to testify. All of this is expensive, uh, calls for expensive litigation. Had we had the money to work with, where we could have employed uh, handwriting experts and psychologists and uh, uh, really uh, investigators to really dig at the root of this thing, I think we would have prevailed in the lawsuit. Well, do you believe uh, you plan to appeal the case? Do you believe that you can win it on appeal? I don't think I can get anywhere in the State Court of Criminal Appeals because I think the present uh, the present makeup of that court, with the exception of one judge, and that's Judge Tom Brett, who, uh, who in my opinion, is fair, and uh, uh, but uh, in the sense of uh, uh, one of the other judges, I, I think if he's going to be able to control, if the pattern follows what it's been in the past, uh, they're conviction-minded, ex-prosecutor, uh, very conviction-minded. This last session of the Senate, we had to pass a resolution asking that court to permit a man to remain on bail while his case was being appealed to the Supreme Court. Prior to this time, they have not even permitted that. If a man appealed from the Court of Criminal Appeals to the Supreme Court of the United States, they still made him go to the penitentiary. Well, that's uh, in violation of all of the concept of appeal and review. What if his case is reversed by the Supreme Court of the United States? Is the state of Oklahoma going to pay him for the time he spent in the penitentiary? Or how can they bring those days back and let him relive them? And that court, as of this date, has not uh, amended its rigid rule and rigid policy. Well, what's wrong with the, with the court system in the state of Oklahoma? Why is it so conviction-minded? Do you believe it's more conviction-minded than it is justice-minded? I think it's more conviction-minded. I think our citizens are more conviction-minded. There's a philosophy that exists today, in my opinion, that you are presumed to be guilty and the burden of proof is on you to prove that you're innocent. Why in the hell is Curtis Harris so popular with all of his asinine statements and attitudes about law enforcement? Uh, his office has everything to work with. They've got the police department, the sheriff's office, investigators out of his office. They're the highest paid lawyers in law enforcement. As re and you take the reverse of that, the public defender system is controlled by the courts. The judges appoint them. They're way underpaid. The chief public defender makes less than Curtis Harris's assistants. They have no investigators. They've got two secretaries. And you tell me that that is justice? What can be done? Well, we tried to do something the last session of the legislature, and we just Mickey Moused around with it. We passed, we passed in the Senate a public defender's bill that call for a statewide public defender system, but we were not paying them the type of money that you could draw the skilled uh, lawyer uh, who, you know, who's going to also look at the, the salary. 
We've got public defenders leaving the public defender's office now, Mike Atkinson, very skilled lawyer, he's leaving the John Curtis's staff because the pay is better. By philosophy and by nature and by involvement, Mike Atkinson is a defense lawyer. But uh, I suspect that he has to worry about living and taking care of his family in the same vein that everybody else does so the pay is more attractive. The work is a hell of a lot easier because the police department, sheriff's department, and investigators out of Curtis's office make your case for you. You don't have to dig up and do all of your own research and dig up your own witnesses. You mentioned a few minutes ago that when Jerry Lee Cudjo was arrested that he passed lie detector tests. Do you, do you know that he did pass them? Well, I, I know that they gave them to him and they released him. And they tell me that they were inconclusive, which in my opinion, opinion is just a bunch of bull. Why would they arrest him then and take him to court? Well, Ramsey passed, uh, and uh, the pressure was on and the heat was on that somebody had to be convicted in this case, and they had to do something. And uh, with Ramsey uh, and uh, uh, taking the position that Cudjo did it, he had nothing to do with it. And the other witnesses, all of whom were identified with the Ramsey family bearing him out, they elected to prosecute Cudjo and uh, not prosecute Ramsey at all. You mentioned also, secondly, that you believe the reward money offered by a metropolitan newspaper uh, anonymously w went to someone in Claude Ramsey's family. Why do you believe that? There is not any doubt in my mind about it, and uh, that source of information comes to me uh, from rather confidential sources within that community. But I'm thoroughly convinced that if the check was to ever be produced, it would have the name of either Claude Ramsey or Lonnie Johnson or uh, Lonnie Johnson's wife or some close member of the Ramsey family. You know, it strikes me strange that Lonnie Johnson left here and went to California after he threw the gun away. And he only stayed a short, stayed a couple of months and then he came back. Uh, from his own testimony, Ramsey furnished the money to, to sponsor that trip. Does he have the money to do that? Well, uh, he said that he sold him a car, but uh, it wouldn't be difficult for that family to get together a uh, hundred or a couple of hundred bucks to send him out there and he could stay with some relatives. Secondly, the Ware girl and Lonnie Johnson were married a week prior to this trial or married a week after the preliminary hearing. And uh, it's just, I, with all of these loopholes and all of the, the, the information I've been able to gather, some of which would not be admissible in the court of law, I'm convinced that Cudjo is not the trigger man and was not the trigger man. You know, it's rather ironic that the district attorney never produced a picture, even though they had hundreds of pictures of the highway patrol trooper's car his hat, flashlight, which would give you the jury a pretty good position, idea of what the position of the car was and what the terrain out there looked like. They never produced those pictures. Why not? Oh, I think they were afraid to because the pictures bore out my argument of how the uh, killing took place. Well, do you believe that uh, you mentioned not in the Court of Criminal Appeals if you, and I understand you do, plan to appeal to the federal court system, do you believe you can ever get uh, Jerry Lee Cudjo's conviction re reversed? Well, the federal court system is, particularly for poor people and, and, and minority people, is uh, the court of best resort, in my opinion. Howard Gaddis would have been electrocuted a long time ago had we not had the federal court system to protect him. Uh, that court of criminal appeals didn't do a damn thing in reviewing his case, in my opinion, but just merely uh, affirm what the lower court did. They didn't even have the integrity uh, to thoroughly review the evidentiary hearing that was taken, which showed that the police officer's testimony was a complete reverse of what it was during the trial of Howard Gaddis. And it was only through saving his life that we were able to go into federal court and uh, delay uh, and cause an evidentiary hearing to be, to, to be held. I'm very, as a lawyer, I'm very critical of the court and perhaps uh, might be in uh, a little jeopardy with the Bar Association, but I don't think that the court's immune from criticism. And uh, 
Hell, it's no more immune from criticism, in my opinion, than the state senate, and we get more than our fair share. I'm somewhat late in doing so, but I'd like to pause briefly and remind our listeners the program is headliners. My guest today is State Senator E. Melvin Porter of Oklahoma City. Senator, you mentioned uh, in another case that uh, the testimony had been changed. In the, in the Jerry Lee Cudjo trial, was any testimony changed between the preliminary hearing and the actual trial? Oh, yes, considerably. Whose? Uh, the Ware Girl, Lonnie Johnson's. Uh, even uh, Claude Ramsey's testimony. You know, here again when we talk about that trial, it's rather ironic that Ramsey stayed in jail 62 days and the court system itself never even sent a lawyer up to see him. He could not make bail and that within itself would indicate that he's apparently in poverty, especially a $2,000 bond. Uh, they did not appoint the public defender and then I questioned, I'm extremely disturbed that the public defender that they appointed to talk to Ramsey when he invoked the Fifth Amendment was Mike Atkinson, who also damn well knew he had accepted a job prior to him talking to Cudjo because it came in the paper the next day with Curtis Harris's office. Now, I just, uh, I think it's so interwoven that uh, even Mike, if he was going to take a job with Curtis, was not going to buck him too much in my opinion, and I could be wrong because I'm really questioning the integrity of another lawyer, but he damn well knew he was going to go to work for Curtis, and he should have asked the court to appoint some other public defender. What's going to happen then? What, what basis are you using for appeal? Just that the whole trial was a farce? Is that what you believe? Well, I think that uh, uh, we'll spell out our reasons when we appeal it. I, there are several reasons that I think that we can ultimately reverse it. They used a gun in the preliminary hearing that was not even involved and brought the gun in the courtroom. I think that was error. They uh, made reference in their closing argument that uh, he should be given the death penalty. And uh, that's not the law. It was not the law, and uh, I think that uh, was highly improper. Uh, I think that uh, he was not tried by uh, his peers, 18-year-olds, were not permitted to serve on the jury. The jury list was chosen from taxpayers, which meant they were property owners rather than uh, other citizens. I think that's discriminatory. We tried to correct that, and we did correct it the last session of the legislature. But nevertheless, it applied in this case. The fact that they held a witness who was a major witness against Cudjo uh, in a form of what I consider coercion, intimidation, and uh, even when Ramsey invoked the Fifth Amendment, Curtis Harris walked up to the bench and told the judge if he didn't testify and he revoked the Fifth Amendment, he was going to charge him with murder. And uh, I stood there and I heard it, the judge heard it, and the court reporter should have it in the record. Well, hell, Ramsey was sitting on the witness stand, and I know he heard it. And so under the fear of being charged with murder and under the fear of being charged, held up in jail 63 days, as a material witness. They wouldn't have uh, conducted uh, that matter in this manner, in my opinion, had it been a black man shooting a black man. Well, do you believe that the district attorney's office, uh, perhaps not this one specifically, or perhaps would be this one specifically, do you believe that in the Oklahoma court system, this is a common practice to, to try to intimidate witnesses to get the testimony you want? Well, Curtis uh, Harris, uh, intimidated from all of the reports I have read in the newspaper, a police officer, because he attempted to further investigate the Carson case, hell yes, they intimidate. Sure they do. They intimidate through the threat of perjury. They intimidate by uh, uh, suspended sentences. Lonnie Johnson was on a suspended sentence. Ramsey was on a suspended, on parole. Sure they intimidate. And it's just, uh, uh, if it was left to them, we wouldn't even have a jury system. They intimidate, sure. Well, you're in a position as a state senator to, to at least try to get some changes in the court system and the justice system. Do you have anything in mind that perhaps this next session of the legislature you would you try to introduce to change some of the what you consider wrongs in the court system? Well, I think that, number one, we need to take the public defender system out from under the district judges and make it an independent system. We need to adequately finance it where they can have investigators. 
we need to set up a system that does not cause a citizen who's charged with a crime to have to expend uh, a hell of a lot of money to make bond and bail. Uh, I, I, I think that uh, these are the areas where we really need to work, but of course the tone of the legislature is to now support law enforcement. Uh, we gave the highest pay raise of any public servant in this state to the district attorneys. We gave them a 5% raise for, this, for the year after their election and a 5% raise the next year, and that's more money than we gave anybody else. That within itself is indicative of the mood of the legislature. And those are all sophisticated, economically secure uh, people who don't really give a damn whether or not uh, poor people are helped that much or not. They think too much of their tax money is going to help them. And uh, if, they were, if it was left to them, in my opinion, the penitent would build a new penitentiary and be able to house uh, twice as many as we've got there now. Well, let me ask you this, moving along on that track a little bit, we just have less than three minutes left in the program, but do you believe there's something wrong with the way the legislature is elected? Uh, obviously, I could not afford to run for the legislature. I can't be gone from my job. Are our laws being made by an upper class of people who don't live the common scale that, that most Oklahomans live? Well, they don't uh, live the common scale that many people do. There's not any question about it. It's very expensive to run. My last election cost me $7,000. How many people can afford to spend that kind of money? I damn sure couldn't. I had to go borrow some of it. Uh, it ruptures your law practice. Uh, uh, but uh, it's very difficult uh, to run, and particularly for those who run for public office out of the metropolitan areas because they're representing two and three and four counties, hundreds of miles that they've got to cover and try to get to voters. And so uh, uh, it causes you to wonder how in the hell can the office be worth that much or is that man really that dedicated? And I don't think that any of us are that damn dedicated that we're just running because we're all humanitarians. I'm sure not. It feeds my ego some. And I want to do some good and try to help the people I represent, but it's not all because I'm 100% humanitarian. Why do men and women run for the legislature? Oh, the selfish pride of their ego. Any man who runs for public office has an ego that uh, he's feeding. He likes the glamour of the public arena. He's a damn life he says he doesn't. I don't care whether it's Curtis or John Kennedy or Lyndon Johnson or Richard Nixon or Melvin Porter. We just have about a minute and a half left in the program, but I do want to ask you this. In that same line of thinking, there have been a lot of charges that the, not just in Oklahoma, but the government itself, by its very nature, is corrupt. Do you think men and women run, uh, a majority, a good percent of them from Oklahoma, run for the legislature uh, for their own personal gain to use their vantage point in the legislature as a position of power? Well, I would not say so. Uh, there are many dedicated men who run, uh, who run and, and who work in the legislature. Uh, but they're human beings, and, and they have, as I said, selfish egos to feed. But by large and far, the nine years I've been there, I would say that, uh, the, uh, and I can only speak for the Senate, that uh, those men are very, very dedicated men. And uh, uh, Power itself is a lust or an enjoyment or an ingredient that, hell, anybody likes to exercise, you know. The poor black uh, wants a piece of action because he wants a voice in the power uh, of government. He wants to be able to manipulate money, manipulate power. Uh, that's going to always exist. Senator, we're out of time. I do appreciate your joining me today. My guest on Headliners has been State Senator E. Melvin Porter of Oklahoma City. This is Mike Williams speaking. Following is an interview. Following is an interview with Dr. E. T. Dunlap, D-U-N-L-A-P, who is the Chancellor of Higher Education in Oklahoma. The interview was made December 24, 1972.